Before we get into this video, I wanted to send a shout out to Mammoth Headwear. They initially had sent me this hat and I, I didn't know whether to be insulted or what because the hats are for larger heads. Now, that's all relative, right? But I've been told I've had a large head all my life, literally and figuratively, right? Especially with the sports takes, you know what I'm saying? It's not that I'm always right, but I say things like I'm always right. That's kind of the key. But, uh, but yeah, so they sent me this snapback here. And they're like, if you like it, wear it. You know, it's cool. And uh, I like it. You see how much hair I got right now. I'm walking the little mini fro, and so it actually fits because I like, sometimes I like to tuck the ears, but I definitely like to tuck the hair, right? And I have different hats for different occasions. If I'm rocking a, a buzz cut, I could put on the dad cap, but right now I, I can't pull that off. And so this blue, what, is it teal? Is it teal under here? I, I like the color scheme and then the logo's dope, mammoth. And so, yeah, shout out to that brand, man, because again, I don't do many sponsorships. I get offer little bits and things here, but I, I turn a lot of it down. Like I'm not trying to do stuff that, that I wouldn't mess with. Right. And so, uh, mammothheadwear.com, go check that out. It's hats for larger heads, but even if you don't have a large head and you just got a bunch of hair or you want to have, um, a little extra room to tuck the ears, go check them out. When you look at the run, the warriors have had the dynasty, what makes it so impressive is they had to do it each year against the best player of this generation in LeBron, right? And now you look at the twilight of this core three trying to do it again. Here they are facing what looks like the greatest player of this next generation in Luka Doncic. Now, there are a lot of similarities between Luka and LeBron, right? You know, um, Obviously, there are some differences as well. The athleticism, the body type. I'd, I'd probably say Luca's a better scorer, right? He's a more uh, insatiable scorer. He likes to score a little more, but there's, right, they're similar in how dominant they are and how much they have the ball. And so I'm sure a lot of you have read and listened to a bunch of complex previews of this series because that's what this matchup is. It's complex, right? It's very dynamic. Two teams that are willing to play small ball a lot of interchangeable parts and switching and, and matchup hunting and stuff like that. Well, I'm going to try to keep it simple because it, it, it's, it, we can get so caught in the weeds here. You look at Luca, and you say, okay, where is he weak? What would, if I've got to take this guy out, what approach do I take? It's his body, right? It's his body, his stamina. Can he hold up? That's how I see it, right? And so I think the Warriors' approach should be make this a war of attrition and an accumulation. You, you remember Kerr, I know, knows. You remember the Jordan rules, right? Well, they need to make the Luka rules. And I don't mean roughing him up. We know he's tough and he's big and he's physical. But make him use every ounce of energy at every chance you can, right? And that may mean going out of your way to do so, right? And First and foremost, you say, okay, well, let's make him defend. You saw Phoenix have success with that early in their series, picking on him. That's fine. But again, what I mean is go out of your way. Because the Warriors' way of making Luka defend is off-ball action and putting him in actions, right? And stuff like that because it's not a traditional pick-and-roll offense. But there's a difference, man. Luka getting beat back door on the baseline is not expending as much energy as him up in ball screen actions and defending the ball. And so you may have to break out of that again with the intention of wearing Luka down. If he, if he gets caught on some post-ups with Wiggins or, or you know, Clay, make him work there every opportune time. Hell, I'd even, you know Wiggins is going to pick him up full court at times. We've seen him do that through each round here with different uh, ball handlers. I'd even throw Juan T out there for 90 seconds or so at a time, use some fouls, just go all out on him. Just make, just be annoying, right? You saw what the Pelicans did to the Suns with Grand Theft, Alvarado, Herb Jones, and they didn't end up winning the series, but I think Dallas can thank the Pelicans for a lot of what happened in that second round matchup. It's an accumulation. So you have to go into it with that mindset. Now, offensively, what that's going to mean is you got to let him get his. That's how I see it. You got to let him get his. You know, and that may mean he puts a 50 piece on the Warriors head early in this series. Hell, he might even do it at Chase Center. 
But again, the accumulation. Can you do this the entire series? It's very similar to the approach. You remember the J.R. Smith game. Game one of the finals, LeBron at Oracle. What did he have, like 56? It was one of the craziest performances of all time. And then, you know, somehow we stole the game. J.R. Smith, the shenanigans, the timeout. Um, and you could tell LeBron, remember, the infamously punched a, a locker, whatever, hurt his hand, right? Because he knew he had spent so much energy in that game. They had to win that game. They had to win that game. And so I think it would be the same approach to just let Luka get his. And again, it may be very frustrating at times, and it, he may seem invincible early in this series, like, damn, he's just going to do this. But that's what I would bet on. Now, you can't just show him the same thing every time. I would send hard traps at him only when, because Luca, look, he has the juice, man, right? He has the juice, the clutch gene. It seems like the bigger the stage, the bigger the stakes, the better Luca plays. But you can also get a sense of when he's cooking and he's trying to take over. And so every now and then, yeah, hard trap him, right? Show him some different looks. But Overall, I think the concept should be stay at home on the shooters and say, all right, Luca, you're going to have to you're going to have to average 45 to beat us. That's the approach that I would take as far as facing this uh, next generational talent in Luka Doncic. Now you look offensively at what we're going to do in Dallas has quietly had a really good defense, man. You know, it's funny, the gap between perception and reality during these playoffs and how much people are really paying attention here because I heard a lot of people say, oh, no, 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 the Suns, you know, the number one contender and the perception was that the Warriors had to go through the Suns. The Suns were the toughest matchup and that's what it was going to be. But if you'd paid attention to Dallas since the Porzingis trade, Dallas defensively and everything they've done, they've kind of appeared to have caught lightning in a bottle. And I think it was pretty clear as the series went on that Phoenix had blown their wad throughout the regular season. And Dallas appeared to be the tougher matchup. Now, when you look at Jason Kidd and his growth as a coach, you know his DNA is to be very aggressive. Take the superstar out of the game. And you saw that in that game seven when they just sent Tuit Booker off every screen action. And I think what Dallas realized as the series went on against Phoenix was, look, they're not going to give Aiton the ball. They don't trust Aiton. Aiton doesn't have the confidence to hurt us in the short roll or just in the roll. And so that made them even more aggressive coming off of Booker. Oh, Chris Paul ain't going to shoot either, right? And so you know that that's going to be a lot of the strategy on Steph is like, hey, we're just going to take the ball out of Steph's hands. And that's why Draymond Green is the X factor in this series to me. Because he's got to be on the floor. We know what he means to this team overall. And he's going to be in a lot of the screen actions. The way he played in that game six against Memphis, we need that every game this series. He has to put pressure on the Mavericks downhill. And to be honest, it's an easier proposition against this Mavericks team where they're just not nearly as big as Memphis. They don't have that rim protection. Draymond cannot come, come off the short roll and just turn and look to the shooters. It's going to be too easy. He's got to get downhill. And a lot of the time he's got to finish because Dallas is going to hide Luka on that back line. Right? If we're not going to attack him in high pick and rolls, he's going to be sitting on someone in the corner, much like you saw Jaw doing for a lot of that series. And so Draymond in the short roll, kicking it to the corner, and Luka just going out and contesting, that's not going to wear him down. Make him make Luka have to contest at the rim. The roll man and the vertical spacing from the Warriors is really the key to the offense, whether that be Draymond, Looney, or young Jonathan Kaminga, those guys setting those screens have to roll hard and be a threat. Otherwise, you see what Dallas can do defensively to guards when there's no threat of someone rolling. And so, you know, again, trying to simplify this approach, you say, well, okay, you got Luka, Brunson, and Dinwiddie. You got Steph, Clay, and Poole offensively. Who has the better series, Wiggins or Dorian Finley-Smith? Draymond or Maxi Kleba? I'm not sure how much Looney can play in this series. I think that that's a concern, whether it's Powell or Kleba. I know everybody expects this thing to go small in Kleba and Draymond, again, is going to be a huge matchup in this. But you look at Powell, he's been a thorn in the Warriors' side since he's been with the Mavericks. And his bounciness and as a vertical spacer, as a lob threat, 
I guess I don't. I here here's my concern with the Warriors. If you if you really want to look at things realistically, here we're missing three of our four rotation guys off the bench. If we were going to go that deep, you know, eight nine deep. But Otto, it, it we'll see if he can be a part of this. We're going to need him, right? GP two and Andre, where Dallas is relatively healthy, right? All they're missing is Tim Hardaway Jr. And uh, I, I'm concerned with that five matchup. Draymond has to give us something offensively. We know Kleba will shoot the ball well, but Dallas, where they are lacking is rim protection. So let's talk a little bit about Jordan Poole because what I thought happened in that Memphis series, ever since Jawgate, right, the reach of the knee and the injury, to me, it seemed like it affected Poole mentally. And he he started to get a little timid. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Like Jordan Poole is set to really get the bag right? Like a a huge change in his life and wealth, right? He watches GP2 go down with that injury, right? That's like his shooting arm. I mean, it can't get any more drastic than that, right? And now he's being accused of hurting Ja Morant and the bad blood is seeming to come to a tipping point here. Memphis reinserts Steven Adams at the rim. Jaron Jackson, the leading shot blocker in the league. And so all of a sudden, Jordan Poole is kind of second guessing finishing at the rim, not just because of the rim protection and size and shot blocking, but just like protecting him, his career. I know that may sound silly, but hey, it would go through my mind if I was him. And so I thought that that's why you really saw him struggle in the latter part of that series, because again, he was in his head about that. Now you look at this Dallas matchup, they don't have that size. They don't have rim protection like that. And so I think Jordan Poole is going to be able to feast downhill at the rim. And that leads me back to the vertical spacing. I'd like to see the Warriors do a lot of guard screening, guard to guard screening. Because what that does is it ensures that the screener is a threat, whether it's a slip, a roll, a pop. You know, I mean, I ask that Draymond, you hope that Draymond can remain aggressive out of those screens. But the reality of it is, you know, we'll be lucky to get, what, 12 points out of him? You know what I mean? And so Clay and Poole, guard to guard screening, even Steph as the screener, invert that. I think that that may cause the most conflict for this Dallas defense and and how aggressive they like to play ball screen. So Poole, much better matchup for him. I expect him to have a better series, particularly downhill, getting to the rim, finishing with their lack of size, which should also mean he's going to get to the free throw line a lot more. After Luka, you'd hope Poole would be next in free throw attempts. I think that that's key. Can Poole stay on the floor defensively? right? They're going to pick on him the most. And that's that's going to be the give and take where he's going to have to get it back on the other end. He's got to make the juice worth the squeeze offensively because defensively, he's just not there yet. And I think he can get there. You look at his, you know, his effort because of his motor and his competitiveness, I think the effort level can get there, right? But right now his experience is just not there. And I say this with love. I say this in hopes of motivating him, He's just kind of a dumb defender right now. He he defends blindly. He doesn't seem like he pays too much attention to tendencies and angles. And so he's out there just reacting to every move. He bites on every hezzy. Every A guy will turn his shoulders back away from the basket and he'll follow him and get high side. He kind of loses concept of man, between the basket and man, you know? And so that only comes with experience and discipline. That's going to be tough. And down the stretch of games, depending on the situation, is he closing games, right? Like if the Warriors are nursing a lead, you probably expect Kerr to go to a bigger, more defensive lineup. Now, if they need firepower and the offense is struggling, then maybe he closes games. But that's something to watch for. I wouldn't be surprised. I I, I could see Otto closing a lot of these games as the fifth guy rather than Poole. But again, is Otto going to be healthy? The sore foot has kind of been a thing all year long. I had said it It kind of almost seemed like that was code for load management. Oh, he's got a sore foot. He's not playing tonight, right? But then when he missed the game six, it's like, oh, well, I guess he really does have something going on with him. And then you consider the fact no Andre, no GP2. This is going to be a tough matchup, man. This is going to be a tough matchup. And I can't call it. Like, I know everybody wants a pick, you know? And it's funny because... People have to understand. I don't. I don't like to try to pull people's uh, fan card, right? You became a fan for whatever reason, and you're enjoying the team. But if we want to flex with fan cards here for a second, listen. I used to save up for the little mini game packs when I was a kid to go to Oracle and watch these Warriors win 20 games a year. 
I've got the tat of the logo on my shoulder before the Steph era. So like, I'm a fan, but that also means I'm an older fan who my fandom was based in losing all those years of struggle and no hope. A lot of you really have only experienced a lot of winning. And so you're much more optimistic when it comes to these picks. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen, you know, the, you watch NBA Twitter and people say, well, oh, we did this and we did that. And you think we can't beat this team when Steph beat that? It, that's not the same. This isn't the same team, right? And so, yeah, I'm pessimistic about this matchup. I also understand that because of my pessimistic nature and just how I viewed the Warriors, of, the, again, my fandom was based in disappointment for all those years. It's only been a seven, eight years of winning compared to like 20 of losing right? So I do understand that I tend to lean towards being pessimistic, not setting myself up to be let down. You know, I think we all can agree this is going to go six or seven games here. And you know, look, I don't have a firm pick. I know that's what everybody wants. Hey, Warriors in six, Mavericks in seven, right? I don't have a firm pick. It could go either way. I can't really call it. Of course, I want the Warriors to win. If I had to guess, I think that Luca wears down. I think they they do enough things, they throw enough bodies at him, and you look at it being the third round, right, where I don't know if he'll have enough left in the tank to carry them through this experience. Warriors have home court, so I'll go Warriors in six. As far as the Eastern Conference Finals, I'm not going to go into too much detail on my pick. Sometimes, again, it's easier for me to make the pick because I'm not emotionally attached to it. I think it's pretty clear Boston should be favored. I think Bam is going to low-key get exposed. You know, there was a lot made about uh, Bubble Tyler Hero, Bubble Hero, right? What about Bubble Bam? Like, to me, Hero has been the player that's gotten better and better. Bam, and this is not to say that he isn't a good player. He's a he's an all-star-ish, you know, versatile big, but he's kind of the same player to me. And I just don't think it's sustainable what Jimmy Butler's doing. You got a gimpy Kyle Lowry, the physicality and versatility of Boston's defense, it's going to be too much for Jimmy to have those big nights. And so hats off to Miami for getting, you know, finding Max Struess and the way they've done it. But I don't think they'll have enough offensive firepower against this Celtics team. So I got Boston coming out of the East. And again, give me the Warriors in six. Could go seven. Who knows, right? You know, I'm just, I'm just hoping for the best. <laughs> but I think that uh, if not for nothing, we've got, we've got two matchups here that should be good entertaining basketball. Boston and Miami could get ugly too, right? But um, they're intriguing matchups. You know, a lot of the time you get to this point in the playoffs and something has happened where you've got a matchup where it's like, yeah, this is kind of whack, right? So at least we've got a final four that's going to be interesting either way. And now I know people are probably looking for my son's take. They're looking for my son's take. I had a little breakdown of that game seven. It was about 10 minutes because it wasn't a lot of basketball, man. Wasn't a lot of basketball, but, uh, you know, generally what I feel like was, okay, this team has clearly taken on the personality of Chris Paul, right? Their leader. Chris Paul has little man syndrome, a Napoleon complex. We all understand that. And I think we also understand that that in part is like what's made him great. That feistiness, like never give an inch mentality of a little guy. We've all competed against people like that in various areas of life, right? You know, a little guy syndrome. Got to explain it. And so I think what happened was the unintended consequence was the Suns took on the personality of having little man syndrome this season. Because logically, after you lose the finals the way you did a year ago, wouldn't the logical thing be to say, hey, all right, Chris, we're going to load manage you, CP. You, you got to load manage like Kawhi, right? We just got to make sure we know we're good enough. We'll get to the playoffs. But we got to make sure that you have enough left in the tank and we got to be fresh for this long run because we ran out of gas last year. That's the logical thing to do, right? But then you look at what Phoenix did with this revenge tour. They did the exact opposite. They came out of the gate guns blazing, trying to show and prove to everybody that that season wasn't a fluke. Again, little man syndrome. And so, surprise, surprise, they run out of gas. And then I think... The straw that really broke the camel's back was we had all been monitoring the DeAndre Ayton situation all season long, making him play for the contract. And 
You heard a lot of veteran players, former players say that's a dangerous game to play just because of the things internally. And then it came to a head apparently in that game seven. And again, I went back and watched the tape. To me, there's kind of a chicken or egg thing going on with Aiton where I'm sure Aiton and his camp feel like, look, you haven't empowered him. You haven't given him the ball enough to develop and show what he can do. But then you've got the Suns who are like, no, 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 no. We give the ball, we give this dude the ball and he's soft. He don't even look at the basket. And I kind of, I'm kind of with the Suns in, in this, in this area where the more I watch Aiton, the more I realize he ain't it. He don't have the juice. He isn't physical enough and he doesn't really want the ball. And you can just see it in his body language. And so after so long, again, they're coming off these screens. Why are you hitting Aiton in the row? He ain't finna do shit with it. And so you saw that come to a head in that game and he got pulled out and it looks like that's probably the last game he'll play for the Suns. And all of a sudden, you know, is this window gone? So it's, I'm out here in the Valley and I, I feel bad. I got a lot of kids I've coached that are diehard Suns fans. Like that's as bad a loss as I've, I can remember. I know people have said it, but I'm here to, to, uh, to co-sign that. When you consider the context of what their roster looks like, the decisions they have to make, where CP's at and, uh, and going out like that. You could lose. Not like that. That was that was downright humiliating. All right, y'all. Let, let's enjoy these conference finals. I'll be back with some takes throughout that. If you want breakdowns of all the Warrior games, you know where to find it on my Patreon. I'm out, y'all.